take our text tonight, looking into the book of Romans, chapter 12. We'll read the second verse of Romans 12. We want to thank Brother John and everyone, really. Thanks to Brother Randy as well for your hospitality to be here. It's really been a joy, so we've enjoyed it very much. So Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 12, looking at verse 2, he says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Rome was a very special place for Paul because for him it was really his, his original home. The Bible tells us that, that Paul was a citizen of Rome in Acts chapter 22, verse 28. And at that time in their world, Rome was the capital of, we could say, the known world, the Gentile capital, that is. And really, Rome built the first, what we might call modern roads, which was, in fact, very instrumental and spreading the gospel by the early church, by the apostles, and has influence on our road systems even today. Now, after, after the apostle Paul was saved, he spent some time with the Lord, the Bible teaches us, the Lord teaching him what it was one-on-one, -on -one, and it was probably not for 11 or 12 years after the Lord saved him that he went on his first missionary journey. Now, many believe uh, that the church at Rome was probably start, started right around or because of the day of Pentecost. Remember all the strangers, the visitors, we might say foreigners, that were gathered in Jerusalem, and as they saw this miracle of the Holy Spirit raining down, the power of God coming down, and, and people were filled in a miraculous way with the Holy Spirit and the Bible talks about specific tongues, specific languages that they spoke, and, and the foreigners were there, and when they witnessed it and when they saw it, they knew that those people had never been to those places wherein they were speaking those languages. They knew it was a miracle. They knew it was from outside of this world, what was happening. And the Bible says at that time, it's the first time Rome's mentioned, it says that there were strangers of Rome as part of the group there that was witnessing this miraculous power of the Holy Spirit feeling what the scripture says was a, about 120. Well, strangers simply means they were foreigners. They were 2,500 miles from home, and, and no doubt they went back to Rome with this message of what had happened, of what he had seen and what they had experienced. Maybe some were saved there at that time. We know that 3,000 were saved by the sermon, by way of the Holy Spirit, when Peter preached. Well, Paul, he had this special place in his heart for Rome. In fact, uh, as we get towards the end of his life, it was, it was probably about 30 years later when we get towards the end of Acts, and, and Paul has at that time been on three missionary journeys. And it's his fourth journey, and the Bible talks about how he has this desire to go back to Rome. In fact, he says in Acts 19.21, I must also see Rome. And of course, the Holy Spirit had a leading and a guidance in Paul's life. And as he would uh, try and, and, and think about going that direction, the Lord would lead him in a different direction. And so when Paul writes this letter, he had not started that church. In fact, it, it's, it's an introduction that he's giving of himself in a sense and of to how one should live with their life in Christ. And so early on in writing this particular letter to this group of believers, Paul was a master of knowing his audience. So he knew that these Christians, they were living in the capital of the Gentile world, the capital of the known world, living in the cultural, economic, and social capital of what was trending in their day. And initially in, in Romans 1.16, he says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The universities of the day were there, no doubt. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. 
And he's talking about, he says, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That means the Gentile, the Jew. We can all be saved. There is a plan of salvation for every one of us. And tonight we can say we are not ashamed of the gospel that makes a radical change in our lives. It's what the world needs to hear. It's what we believe. More importantly, it's what we have experienced. We are not ashamed that the gospel makes a real change in our lives. It makes a transformation, an about face. We go from death unto life. We are not ashamed that the gospel breaks the chains of sin in our lives. If you get a hold of real salvation, you will not lie anymore. God will deliver you from alcohol. God will give you victory. He will break those chains. We are not ashamed that the gospel takes us from death unto life. I remember before I was saved, I felt so dark inside. And I was a church kid. I knew the way. And I wasn't too bad by the world's standards, but I had sin on board. I was on my way to hell, and I knew it. But we are not ashamed that the gospel transforms our lives. We are not ashamed that the gospel completely, totally, and entirely has changed our lives and can change lives tonight. It's why we're here. Christ can save you. He will deliver you. He will give you victory. He gives us victory over hopelessness, despair, darkness. We have everlasting hope. We have everlasting life a taste of that true freedom when Christ does that work in our hearts. I, I was thinking about a time in our lives where we needed a change. We've been introduced to a couple of youngsters, babies that were born here uh, recently, and, and back home in, the, in our home church, we've had some new, new ones born. And I always like to ask the parents, how do they sleep the night through? And... Um, I, I, this is a story I've probably told before, maybe even here, I, I don't know, but um, I remember when our first was born, the first night in the hospital, I remember watching the clock, and dear little Graham, he was up every 30 minutes that entire night. And so, you know, we went home, and this was our first baby, and, and we were so excited, of course, and um, I mean, I think he was up probably every hour, and he cried, and he cried, and he cried, and, and within a few days, you know, we, we felt like we were zombies. We didn't even really feel like we were alive. And so, um, you know, they said, well, he's got colic, and so after two months, it'll change. And so we'd look forward to two months, or after six months, it will change. This radical change will happen, and, and well, nothing happened. And then Pretty soon they said, well, he's got acid reflux. And so they gave him medicine, and, and we gave it to him, and we really hoped that it would work. Nothing worked. In fact, I rocked him every direction possible. I would have done somersaults with him to get him to go to sleep. He, but nonetheless, he cried, and he cried, and he cried. And, and um, it turned out he was always sick. He was on antibiotics. He always had a sore throat. And, and it wasn't until he was two years old, and they do the surgery on your second birthday. They wait till that age, and they took out his, his tonsils. They took out his adenoids. He had ear tubes, and, and we brought him home, and it was a radical change in our, in our lives. Not quite to salvation, but it was a <laughs> radical change in our lives. And all of a sudden... He slept, I mean, like a baby, yet he was two years old. And so when Hudson came along, and Hudson came along actually soon before he was, before he was, he was two, uh, they're just about two years apart, and oh, we, the anxiety and, and the worry and the concern. Uh, how, how is he going to be? And we're so thankful that he did. He did pretty good, and, and Ava did pretty good as well. But I, I remember the change in our lives. And how refreshing it was. And, you know, we really can't explain to you what the change is at salvation lest you've experienced it. It is, we use terms like it, it is supernatural, it's from outside of this world, it's radical, 
you will know that you know that you know that Christ has saved you. And that's what we're talking about. That's what we need. That's what it will take to make heaven. We won't make heaven otherwise. It's more than a mental acceptance. Paul goes on to tell the Romans in our text, he says, and be not conformed to this world. That original for conform means fashioned alike. That is to conform to the same pattern of the world or it even re refers to a union or to be get together with. So he's obviously talking about don't be conformed, don't act like, don't talk like, don't look like, don't go to the same places that the world enjoys. But he says, but be ye transformed. Now, the world today, if we think about it, would get us to believe that whatever in your mind you want to be, you can transform into that. If you think you are something, or if you feel like you are something, well, you must be that thing. Now, I might wish that I was six foot seven and could dunk the basketball. In fact, today I was thinking about that, really trying. No matter how hard I men mentally think that, nothing changes. Do, do we understand the lack of reality that the world is at today? That our young people are dealing with? That culturally we're dealing with? I could mentally live in fantasy land, but it does not change the reality. But we understand where we are at in the world. The world would say, think it and be it, young people. But I want to tell you tonight, the gospel is much, much more than a mental acceptance. You cannot think your way to salvation. We need something down in our hearts. We need something radical. We want something far more than just an emotion. And God made our emotions, and, and, he, and there's a connection to our, our soul, our spirit, and our heart when we have that experience with the Lord where we know in our hearts, we know in our spirit that we have been made alive. The gospel is far more than a transformation of the mind. It's a transformation of the heart. It's the transformation of our soul. It's deliverance from sin. It's deliverance from living with the world as the world. So Paul says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so in order for it to get down into our hearts, there, it begins with our mind. Somebody told us about salvation. Maybe a, a Sunday school teacher or a friend or we were brought to church and, and somebody preached it to us or taught it to us. And then we do, as he said, a renewing of our mind. We have to make a mental decision to say, you know what? I turn my back on sin. You know what? I surrender. Lord, I can't do it anymore. You know what? I do need salvation. There has to be a, a, a mental a, a point in time where we make that decision. That's about our will. That's what uh, making a conscious decision of what I'm doing. I'm sorry for the things that I'm doing. I'm sorry for the way that I'm living. I need a transformation of the heart. I need supernatural help from heaven. We want to get it from our minds down into our heart. Lord, I've changed my mind. Lord, I need you to change my heart. As the proverb said, who can make a heart clean? Who can really, what it's referring to, save a soul? We can't. No human can't. We have to decide we need you, Jesus, and Jesus will make that transformation. But I do know that there are many here that have already experienced this trans transformation. But it was also Paul, he was writing to a pastor a Christian, a believer, one that had been in the gospel for a while. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6, he says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God. And you know, in the original, that stir up means to rekindle. Or we could say it means a renewing. Or we might even refer to it as personal revival. A revitalization of our walk with the Lord. And that's why we're all here this weekend. We want a renewing, a stirring up, a revitalization of our walk with the Lord in our hearts and even in our minds and deep down in our souls. We, our spirit yearns we would say as Christians for a deeper walk with the Lord. In fact, a scripture that 
stood out to me this afternoon was the prophet Jeremiah. He yearned for something. He lamented for something. He said in Lamentations 5.21, Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old. You know, I was thinking here, sitting on the platform, I remember a prayer meeting, I think it was 1994 in the tabernacle, where in a very special, marked way, the Spirit of God fell at camp meeting. We could not have night service because God was working in such a special way. And many of us remember 2001 when the Spirit of God rolled up and down like waves in that uh, tabernacle and how special that was. And I was talking to Brother Donald last night. He, he brought up Midwest camp. And the last time I went to Midwest camp was that same year where the Spirit of God came down, 2001. And baptized me. I was baptized with this Holy Spirit. And I'll tell you, young people, people of all ages, we want to renew our days as of old. We want prayer meetings like that. We want the Spirit of God to move. We want to have th times and, and, and where it didn't matter who was preaching, who was singing, there was an anticipation to be at church. Every service there was an anticipation to be at church. We didn't want to miss it. I want to feel that way. We want to experience that. We want our young people to experience that. That's what's important. We want to be changed. Jesus told that man that he healed that had an infirmity eight years by the pool of Bethsaida, rise, take up thy bed and walk. Immediately, the Bible says he was made whole. Immediately, instantaneously, Jesus finds that man in the temple and he says, thou art made whole, sin no more. <clears throat> that's what we preach and that's what we teach because we've experienced it. Christ has done it for us in our lives. There was the woman taken in adultery that they brought before the Lord, and Jesus seems to ignore them. He gets down on the ground and he writes, and some believe he wrote the sins of those that came before him and that were accusing her, because the Bible talks about that they left from the oldest unto the last. What did Jesus tell her? Go and sin no more. You see, something radical had happened. A transformation had happened. That's what we want to experience. That's what's available for you and me tonight. Jesus is passing this way. He is here. The song says he is here. You can touch him. If you need to be healed, God wants to do something radical for you tonight. He wants to touch you. He wants to heal you. He wants you to be made whole. If you're in a valley of decision about salvation, Maybe you're a hypocrite. Maybe you're a backslider. The Lord wants to do a transformation in your life. Something radical. Something where you have put your life and your trust in Christ and you will live eternally in eternal glory with the Lord. We can't even touch that, but we can experience that touch tonight on what Jesus will do for you. If you need to be sanctified, you need a transformation. I'll tell you what Christ will do. There's power in the blood of Jesus to purge. And if you aren't sure if you're sanctified, Christ will purge you. He will make you holy. He will cleanse you. You will know what, have hap what has happened. And what's the point of that? To prepare you for his precious Holy Spirit. The Lord will do that. We want to see special works by the Lord tonight. We want signs and wonders to follow his word. Just as the scripture says, the Lord will do it. The song is 281. Let's come out and pray. God bless each and every one of you.